Okay, let's dive in. Today, we're uh, really unpacking some key insights for anyone working in endoscopy, focusing specifically on the esophagus. That's right. Our main source here is a uh, really informative video from Dr. G.S. Raju. It's from the 2025 ASGE Endoscopy Tech course, the section on the esophagus. A great resource. Absolutely. And we should also mention we use the Google Notebook LM audio overview to help map out our discussion from that video. Good tool. So our mission today is pretty straightforward. Pull out the essential anatomy and pathology of the esophagus that's most relevant for you. Yeah. The techs and nurses assisting during procedures. Exactly. We want to cover those common conditions, you know, how they look on the scope and the details from the source that can really help you understand what's happening. Yeah, the goal is to connect what you're seeing, what the physician's saying, with the actual clinical picture. Help you anticipate things. Right, to really understand why certain things are being noted or measured. Okay, let's uh, start with the basics. The path of the esophagus. Seems simple? but they're important landmarks. It really is just a muscular tube. It takes food from the mouth down to the stomach. It goes through the chest, then passes through an opening in the diaphragm, that big muscle under your lungs. The hiatus. The hiatus, exactly. Yeah. And then it just dips into the abdomen briefly before joining the stomach. That whole area where it meets the stomach, the GE junction, that's super important. And what are the key parts right around there that the video really focused on? Well, you've got the esophagus itself with that uh, pale squamous lining. Then as it goes through the diaphragm, it's hugged by the diaphragmatic carora. That muscle forms a sort of ring. Good. The opening is the hiatus, like you said, and then boom, you're into the stomach, different lining. You see the folds. So how do those pieces normally stop stomach stuff from, you know, coming back up? Reflux seems so common. It is common and stopping it is the job of the anti-reflux barrier. The video really stressed this. It's key to preventing heartburn, G-E-R-D. It's not just one thing, though. No, it's a system. The diaphragmatic cura acts like an external pinch, an external sphincter. Then inside, you have the LES, the lower esophageal sphincter, that muscle ring at the bottom of the esophagus, plus a kind of flap valve from the angle it enters the stomach. Ah, so internal and external working together. Exactly. The internal parts plus that external squeeze from the diaphragm, that's what should keep acid down. Okay, so when that barrier fails, that's heartburn, and if it keeps happening, G-E-R-D. That's it. Heartburn's the feeling. G ordays the disease from that repeated acid exposure because the barrier isn't holding up. And endoscopy is crucial because we can actually look at that GE junction. And look for that diaphragmatic pinch the source mentioned. What is that exactly? Yeah, as you're putting the scope down towards the stomach, you'll see this like circular squeeze. Tightens and loosens with every breath the patient takes. Ah, that's the diaphragm muscle. That's the diaphragmatic or the muscle ring, squeezing as it moves. It's a really clear marker showing you exactly where the diaphragm is crossing the esophagus. Okay. And I know a really, really common problem there is a hiatal hernia. How did the video explain spotting that? Right. A hiatal hernia is basically when part of the stomach slides up through that opening at the hiatus into the chest. So the GE junction moves up. Exactly. It pulls the GE junction, that transition point, above the diaphragm. Normally it should be below. So endoscopically, the key is seeing that the GE junction is higher up than that diaphragmatic pinch. It's about the distance then. The source had that great example for measuring it, right? Yes. Perfect example. As you pull the scope back, you note the distance marker for the diaphragmatic pinch, say. The video used 40 centimeters from the teeth. Okay, 40 centimeters for the pinch. Then you keep pulling back and note where the stomach folds start. That's the GE junction. Let's say that's at 35 centimeters. Ah, so the GE junction is at 35, but the pinch is lower down at 40. Exactly. The GE junction is 5 centimeters above the hiatus, so 40 minus 35 equals 5. That's a 5 centimeter hiatal hernia. That's such a clear way to put it. Just using those distance marks, so for the staff, knowing how to spot the pinch and understand that measurement is really key. Absolutely. You're assessing that whole anti-reflux system and is a hernia part of the problem. Right. Okay, so speaking of acid getting past the barrier, what does that do to the lining itself over time? Well, chronic acid exposure can cause actual damage, visible injury. We call that erosive esophagitis. And there's a grading system for that, the LA system. Yes, the Los Angeles classification. It helps standardize how bad the damage is. How does that break down? What were the key distinctions mentioned? It goes from A, mildest, to D, most severe. 
grade A, you see one or more breaks, erosions, but they're small, less than five millimeters long. Okay. Grade B, you still have those longitudinal breaks, but at least one is five millimeters or longer. And bigger. Yep. Grade C, the damage is more extensive. The erosions kind of connect across the folds, but it doesn't go all the way around. Not circumferential. Right. But grade D, that's the worst. The damage is pretty much completely circumferential. It goes all the way around. Got it. So the physician is looking at the length, the pattern. But what about those patients? You hear this a lot. They have terrible heartburn. But you scope them and nothing. Looks normal. Yeah, that happens often. It's called non-erosive reflux disease or NRD. The symptoms are real, definitely, but no visible erosions on the scope. So how do you figure out if it's really acid causing it then if you can't see the damage? Well... The approach discussed was using a pH probe. The Bravo pH capsule is a common one. It's a little device clipped onto the esophageal wall during the endoscopy. And the patient just wears it. Yeah, they go home with it attached inside. It wirelessly records the acid levels for like four days. Gives you objective proof of whether there is significant acid reflux happening, even without visible erosions. Oh, that's neat. So the scope finding, or lack of finding, directs the next step. <laughs> okay, let's move to Barrett's esophagus. That's a more serious consequence of long-term reflux, right? Yeah. It is. Barrett's is considered precancerous. It's where the normal squamous lining gets replaced by columnar cells, the kind you usually find in the stomach or intestine. It's the body trying to protect itself from the acid, but it's not a good change long-term. And this is where those measurements we talked about, the distances, become even more important. Like, the endoscopist is calling out several numbers. Absolutely critical here. You're tracking three key landmarks. First, the diaphragmatic pinch, the hiatus, say, at 40 centimeters again. Okay. Second, the GE junction, top of the stomach. Folds maybe at 35 centimeters in our example. Still a five centimeter hernia then. Right. And third, the squamocolumnar junction, the SCJ. That's the visible line where the pale squamous lining stops and the different, usually redder or beefier columnar lining begins. Got it. The color change line. Exactly. Let's say you see that line clearly at 30 centimeters. Now you use these numbers. Hiatal hernia is still hiatus minus GE junction, 40, 35, quads 5 centimeters. But now you measure the Barrett's segment. And the source talked about specific C and M measurements for Barrett's. Yes, super important for documentation and follow-up. C is for circumferential extent. How far up from the GE junction does that columnar lining go all the way around the esophagus? Okay, circumferentially. So in our example, if it was circumferential all the way up to that SCJ line at 30 centimeters, the C measurement is GE junction, 35 centimeters, minus the top of the circumferential part, 30 centimeters. So C equals 5 centimeters. C5. Makes sense. And the M. M is for maximum extent. This measures from the GE junction up to the absolute highest point you see any columnar lining, even if it's just little tongues or islands shooting up higher. Ah, so it might not be circumferential that high up. Exactly. Maybe those tongues reach up to 28 centimeters. So the M measurement is GE junction, 35 centimeters minus the highest tongue, 28 centimeters, which equals 7 centimeters. So you document that as C5M7 Barrett. It's precisely. C5M7. It tells you 5 centimeters is circumferential, but the maximum extent reaches 7 centimeters up from the GE junction. Understanding those three landmarks pinch, GEJ, SEJ, and how they give you C and M is vital for assisting. Yeah, you can really follow along with what the physician is quantifying. Okay, let's uh, switch gears completely. Patients coming in vomiting blood or known varices. Different anatomy involved here. Totally different. Now we're talking about the portal venous system. Hmm. Think spleen, liver, and the big veins. Splenic vein, superior mesenteric vein, SMV. Uh, okay. Normally, blood from the spleen via splenic vein and intestines via SMV merge to form the portal vein, which flows into the liver for processing. But in cirrhosis, that flow gets blocked. Exactly. Cirrhosis scars the liver, makes it hard. This creates resistance. Pressure backs up in the portal vein. That's portal hypertension. Blood can't get through the liver easily. So it has to find detours, uh -huh. like the varices. Precisely. The blood gets rerouted, shunted into veins that aren't built for that pressure, especially around the esophagus and the top part of the stomach, the fundus. The these veins swell up, get twisted, fragile. Those are viruses. High risk of bleeding. So the blood flows kind of around the esophagus first, then gets into the wall. How does that work? Yeah, the source detailed this pathway. The backed up blood goes into veins surrounding the esophagus perisophageal veins. These are connected to the veins inside the esophageal wall by little connector vessels called perforator veins. Perforators. Okay. 
the high pressure blood pushes through these perforators into the esophageal veins, making them bulge into varices inside the lumen. And the video pointed out something really specific about where those perforators are concentrated. This sounds like a key clinical pearl. It really is. The source highlighted that the highest density, the most perforator veins feeding into the esophageal wall are found in the distal five centimeters of the esophagus, right near the GE junction. Wow, so that directly impacts treatment, like banding. Absolutely, that's the anatomical reason why variceal banding treatment starts near the GE junction and focuses heavily on that last five centimeters. You're trying to cut off the inflow through those dense perforators in that specific zone. Understanding that explains why the doctor is working intensely in that small area. Exactly, it connects the anatomy directly to the procedure technique. Okay, great example. Let's move to another common reason for scoping. Dysphagia, difficulty swallowing. Right, dysphagia. The source basically broke it down into two main categories of causes. Either the pipe is narrowed, a physical mechanical blockage, or the muscle isn't working right. A motor problem with peristalsis or the LES relaxing. What's normal swallowing supposed to look like muscle-wise? Well, ideally, the lumen's wide open. You get that nice coordinated wave of contraction peristalsis pushing food down smoothly. And then critically, when the food hits the bottom, the LES relaxes at just the right moment to let it pop into the stomach. So motor dysfunction means that wave is messed up or the LES stays shut. Pretty much. Conditions like achalasia, which was mentioned, are classic examples. The muscle coordination is off, food just gets stuck. What about the blockages, the strictures? The source mentioned a few common types. Yeah, different kinds of narrowing. A Schatzky's ring is pretty common, especially in older folks. It's a thin, smooth ring right at the GE junction. Causes trouble with solids like bread or meat. Sometimes food gets completely stuck. An impaction. Right. Then you have peptic strictures. Those are from long-term acid damage healing with scar tissue. Usually benign, often described as simple strictures, fairly short, straight narrowings. And the more worrying kind. Malignant strictures. Cancer. These usually cause more severe dysphagia. It gets worse quickly, maybe weight loss too. Endoscopically, they often look like complex strictures, longer, more irregular, maybe kind of twisted or torturous. And how does the approach change if it looks simple versus complex? Well, the main treatment is dilation, stretching it open. The source explained you first judge. Simple or complex, simple benign looking ones. You can usually just use a balloon dilator or a bougie. Okay. But for complex ones, especially if you suspect cancer, because they can be tricky, irregular, yeah. you often need guidance. Maybe thread a guide wire through first, then slide the dilator over the wire, or use fluoroscopy live x-ray to watch the dilator going through. Makes sense. And if you find one of those complex suspicious strictures and the biopsies come back as cancer, hmm. what's next involving endoscopy? Right. If cancer's confirmed, the big next step is staging. Figuring out how advanced it is. You know, initial scans like PE or PET-CT look for distant spread lungs, mm. liver. M1 disease. Exactly. If there's no distant spread, the patient often comes back for endoscopic ultrasound, EUS. And EUS is for the local picture. How deep the tumor goes, nearby nodes. Precisely. EUS gives you that cross-section view of the esophageal wall itself and the structures right next to it. To really get what the doctor is seeing and saying during EUS, you need to know the layers of the esophageal wall. The source reviewed these. Okay, run through those layers again, inside out. Sure. You start with the lumen, the channel, then the mucosa, the inner lining, then the submucosa, thicker, has vessels, nerves, then the muscularis propria, that's the main muscle layer for peristalsis, and finally, the adventitia, the outer layer connecting to nearby stuff like the aorta. And the T-stage of the cancer is all about which of those layers it's gotten into. That's exactly it. T-staging on EUS is about depth. T1 means it's into the submucosa. T2 means it's reached or gotten into the muscularis propria. T3, it's gone all the way through the muscularis propria. And T4. T4 is the deepest local stage the tumor is invading adjacent structures outside the esophagus, like the aorta or the airway. Understanding those layers and seeing them on the EUS screen helps you make sense of why the physician is calling it T1, T2, T3, or T4. It's crucial information. Well, yeah, that really connects the dots from the image to the clinical stage. It really does. Shows you why EUS is so powerful for that local assessment. We've definitely covered a lot of ground today from, you know,
basic reflux mechanics all the way to varices, complex strictures, cancer staging, mm. all viewed through what you see and do during endoscopy. And the real takeaway, I think, for you listening is that understanding this anatomy, the pathologies, and especially those specific measurements and observations we pulled from the source. Like the pinch, the hernia calculation, LA grades, C and M for Barrett's. Yeah. The distal 5 centimeter for varices, simple versus complex strictures, those EUS layers. Knowing that stuff is just invaluable. It's not just interesting. It makes you a better assistant. Mm. You can anticipate needs, understand the assessment as it's happening, provide smarter support. It really elevates your role. You're not just passing instruments. You're an informed part of that diagnostic and therapeutic process. Well, that was a really solid deep dive. Yeah. Some fantastic practical details from... Dr. Raju's presentation there. You know, what's kind of amazing to think about is how something seemingly simple, like swallowing or just having heartburn, involves such incredibly complex anatomy all working together, <laughs> or sometimes failing to work together, yeah. and how focusing on those specific visual cues, those measurements you take during the procedure, transforms it. It's not just looking, it's gathering critical data that directly guides how that patient is treated. Definitely something to keep thinking about, how these concepts connect to what you see and do every day in the endosuite. Mm -hmm. That ongoing connection is key.